Okay, hi. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about a alternative um, design paradigm for base layers on blockchains. And the key idea is to separate the consensus layer of a blockchain from its execution layer. And this is useful for many reasons. Um, one of them is because right now, if you wanted to build an application on the blockchain that requires a lot of on-chain data storage, then you can't, you can't really do that cheaply at the moment. Because if you want to use a Bitcoin or Ethereum, for example, the data storage costs are very high. So you would have to probably use something like IPFS. But IPFS generally isn't suitable for applications because IPFS doesn't provide ordering on messages and it doesn't provide a 100% data availability guarantee because your data can be lost if no one is interested in it. But with systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum, because they couple um, data and execution of the messages that are being posted, um, there is, we need, I think we need something in between. We need something, we need a blockchain that can just be used for posting data on it, but not for execution. Because for many applications like that just need to post records, for example, if you want to build a domain name registration system, then you don't really need any execution. You don't really need an execution environment. You just need a place where you can post and order messages. And this is based on a paper uh, which I uploaded the draft of an archive. If you're interested, the link is on the slides. So currently most blockchains, or pretty much every blockchain, uses this kind of similar design paradigm where consensus and state execution is coupled together in the same layer. And what I mean by that is that if you're on a node, specifically a full node, and you want to check that block is valid, then you basically need to do two things. The first thing is you need to check that the block has consensus. In the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum, that would mean checking that that block is in the chain with the most accumulated proof of work. But just because the chain is in the, is in the longest chain, so just because, I mean, just because a block is in the longest chain, doesn't mean that block is valid. If a block contains an invalid transaction, then that block will be rejected. So that's the second thing uh, to check that if a block is valid, you have to actually execute all of the transactions in that block and make sure that all transactions are valid. And obviously this is a huge bottleneck because that means every full node has to download and execute every single transaction and run it through a state machine to <coughs> ensure that all of the transactions in all of the blocks are valid. So if you wanted to decouple the consensus layer or the data availability layer from the execution layer, then what we could do is we can just create a version of Bitcoin or Ethereum where you're actually allowed to post invalid transactions on the chain. So and the way that you prevent uh, bad behavior is that you basically say that the nodes download all of these transactions and they compute the state of, of the chain locally. So instead of every single node executing the transactions, or instead of the miners executing the transactions and only allowing valid transactions in the block, let's say we can allow invalid transactions in the block, and that eliminates the need for nodes to validate any transactions in that block, because the state of the blockchain and, and the balances that everyone has is executed locally by the nodes that, that are downloading these transactions. So for example, if someone posts a double spend transaction on the blockchain, then that transaction will simply be silently discarded by the nodes that are computing the state of the chain locally. So what that would look like is we would basically have a, a state transition function that cannot return an error. Instead of returning an error, the function would simply return the old state, so the state would remain the same if the new transaction that is being posted is invalid. So, as I said, because the chain is only used for posting arbitrary messages or transactions, then the miners or the block producers don't actually have to care about what's inside these blocks. They only have to care about producing the blocks 
and collecting the messages from people and posting, the, posting what messages there are onto these blocks. They don't actually have to look or pause any of these messages or execute anything on them. Now, if you, now I consider this to be like the basic bare version of a blockchain. Like this is, the mini, this is like the minimum viable product that you need to build a basic functioning blockchain that you could use to build applications on top of like a cryptocurrency. So in this model, instead of checking that every single transaction is valid, what you need to do, what uh, nodes need to do to verify that blocks are valid, is simply check that when they receive a new block header, they need to check that all of the data behind that block header is actually available and has been published to the network. Because if a miner uh, publishes a block header but doesn't actually publish the transactions behind that block header, then you can end up in a situation where people can't compute the state of their applications on the blockchain. So and then they can't and then they can't use the blockchain anymore. So as a bare basic minimum requirement, you need those to validate that the transactions in the chain have actually been published and are available to the network. So this basically reduces to the problem. So what you're doing here is you're basically reducing the problem of block verification to data availability verification. So there are no transaction rules, there's no rules about what transactions you can post, as long as the data of those transactions have actually been published. Now you can actually check that um, some piece of data is available without needing to download all of that data. And you can do this probabilistically using something called data availability proofs. Um, there's a paper on, on archive that I co-authored with Alberto from UCL and Vitalik. If you want to, if you're interested in reading about that, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I'll summarize it here. The basic idea is that you create an e-rated coded version of a block, and you what and what nodes can do to verify that the block is available. They can randomly sample different chunks from the block, and that can give them a very, very high guarantee, like 99.99% or even higher guarantee, that the entire block is available just by sampling a few chunks. And the number of chunks that you have to sample is irrespective of the size of the block. So even if you increase the block size, you still can, you still need to sample the same amount of uh, chunks in that block to get roughly the same amount of um, data availability guarantee. But the caveat to this is that the bigger the block, the more nodes you need in the network. Because the, this scheme only works if there's only enough nodes in the network that to collectively sample, to, to make enough, um, sample enough chunks in the block such that they can collectively reconstruct the entire block. Think of it as a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network like BitTorrent. In BitTorrent, you can have multiple peers that, could, that have different parts of the file, and they can all communicate with each other to share, that, to share the different parts of the file until they have the full whole file. So this has two consequences. So as I said, you, because with this scheme, you only have to check that the data of the block is available to validate it. Don't actually care about what the, what the data is. What that means, and because, as I mentioned, that you can uh, validate the availability of the block in, um, by only sampling a, a static number of chunks, that means you can actually validate blocks in some limited time, which is something that um, people have been trying to achieve using much more complicated cryptography, like Z zero knowledge proofs and ZK stocks. So the orange line here, so this graph shows how much data you need to download uh, back from a node to verify a block um, if you increase the block size. The orange line shows uh, the, the um, amount that you have to download if you are using data availability proofs as you increase the block size. And the blue line shows if you don't use data availability proofs. So you can see the, uh, the orange line is almost flat the only reason why it increases logarithmic, um, increases logarithmically because the size of the record proofs increase, but the actual data and chunks you download 
stays the same. And secondly, the more nodes you have in the network, the higher the block size you can have, because the more, the more chunks they will sample collectively. Um, and this is basically a scale-out property, which systems like sharding, uh, shard, sharding based systems try to achieve, except that this, is, this isn't sharding at all, even though it, it achieves the same kind of scalability property as sharding. And I think this is interesting to me because if you think about what is the world's most decentralized protocol, it's basically BitTorrent. At one point, BitTorrent handled half the, uh, half the internet traffic in the world. Before Net Netflix was around, everyone used to download the, the movies of BitTorrent. And BitTorrent is very scalable because the more nodes you have in the network, the more bands the network has, and the more files the network is storing, and the greater the the uh, storage capacity of the network. But I think the reason why BitTorrent is so scalable is because it doesn't have an execution layer. BitTorrent is simply there to um, uh, host data on it. And so I think if we can simplify the, the problem of block verification to data availability verification, we can achieve similar scal scalability properties to peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing systems like BitTorrent or IPFS. So, now this is also interesting from the perspective of the execution model. So as I mentioned, there is no on-chain execution, and all of the state of the, state of the applications of the chain are computed locally by clients. So in this model, um, people can define their own applications, but the code of the applications isn't posted on-chain. It's simply distributed off-chain to the nodes that want to use that application. And that application can post messages relevant to it on the chain. And because the logic isn't defined on the chain, you don't have to, you can write your application in any language because they're executed locally by clients. And the client only needs to download the transactions rele relevant to the application that they're using, not, not necessarily every single transaction. So applications can also have their own namespaces. And if you put them in a medical tree ordered by namespaces, then you can basically allow clients to um, query nodes that have the whole blockchain for transactions relating to their specific application. So the key kind of uh, principle behind this model is something called application state sovereignty. So for this to work, um, applications can't directly modify the state of other applications. Because if one application modifies the state of another application, then that means the other application has to also, the users, the users of the other application have to also verify the state of the first application. And that, that violates the principle where users should only need to download the transactions of applications that they are using. So basically, applications are sovereign in the, in, uh, in the sense that only they can get to control their own state. And this does limit the kind of applications you can put on the blockchain to some extent. But that doesn't mean that applications can't use each other. You can still define your own application that takes a dependency on someone else's application. But you can't force someone else's application to take a dependency on your application. So you can still have like interoperating applications. And this can be thought of as a similar model to sidechains, because in sidechains, um, obviously, at least uh, without cross-chain communication, sidechains can't directly modify the state of other sidechains. In order to do that, they have to go back to the main chain, because all of these sidechains are running independently, and they manage their own state. So this can be thought of as a similar system to sidechains, except that you're not running into the same problem that systems like Plasma Hub has with data availability, because all of these sidechains share the same chain for data availability. And one of the main problems with Plasma is data availability, and there's no easy solution to it. Um, I think the primary use cases for something like this, as I said, is applications that require a lot of on-chain data storage. Um, for example, uh, if you wanted to create a 
decentralized version of Twitter, for example, with 100% data availability guarantees, then you could use this because it would be much cheaper than posting everything on Ethereum. Or something that just requires record storage, for example, a domain name registration system or a land registry. And also, it could potentially be useful as a data availability, data availability layer for other blockchain schemes, um, like Plasma, as I said, but also um, schemes such as zero knowledge rollup, if you're familiar with that. I don't have time to go into it in detail. But um, there are schemes that will use zero knowledge proofs, uh, and compress the entire blockchain into zero knowledge, into ZK SNOCs, but they need also data availability proofs to verify that the data behind the SNOCs are actually available. I'll be around um, if you have any questions. Uh, my time is up. Thank you for listening. <laughs>